Well, good morning, church. My name is Stephen. I have the privilege of serving as a lead pastor here. And today, I'm actually not preaching, which normally I'm sad about, but today I'm excited about because we have um, a real friend and father of this house uh, with us today. Uh, pastor Jim Critcher is uh, a, a skilled musician. He learned from the world-renowned guitarist Christopher Parkening. Uh, he was really a, a renaissance man. I mean, he's owned his own recording studio. Um, he, he speaks on the human soul and emotions. Um, he's a prophet, which that might catch some of you guys by su surprise, like, what is that? But basically what that is, is God has given gifts to the church and people. He's given people with the gift of evangelism and who are men and women who have the gift of uh, pastoring and teaching, those who are apostles uh, and those who are prophets. And a prophet is simply one who hears from God and speaks on God's behalf to encourage us, to build us up in our faith. It doesn't uh, supersede scripture. It doesn't go outside of scripture. But God has given men and women to us, the New Testament church, to build us up and to encourage us. And so he is that to us as a church, Grace Covenant, in multiple locations. Uh, Pastor Jim has been uh, one of our senior leaders for over 20 years here at this church. Um, if you like this building, he's a good reason why, because he worked with our architect really to design the space. Um, and, and I would say lastly, he's a, a spiritual father to, to Elise and to myself. Um, he's really walked with us over the years and helped cultivate the gifts inside of me. He's been there for us in, in some really good moments and, and dark moments. He's been a, a spiritual father to us, him and his wife, Angie. They've been married for 42 years. Is it 42? <laughs> 44 years. 44 years. They have two adult children and four perfect grandchildren. I got that part right. Four perfect grandchildren. Would you give a warm Grace Covenant Church Capitol welcome to Pastor Jim? All right. Well, good morning. I was supposed to be here seven months ago, but let me see if we can get the chronology correct. Is that the Sunday I was going to preach would have been, he got COVID. He preached the first service in this building, Pastor Mark. And then, so I said, no, you got to preach when you get well. And then I was supposed to be back in like, what, March or something? Then, I, then my wife and I got COVID. And so it's taken this long to get here, but wow, what a delight. And uh, I'm, I'm happy about this room. It turned out well. I cannot begin to, you see these, you see in the balcony, you see these wires, these cables in between. Them. I had no, no less than six discussions with the architects because they wanted to put plexiglass in that space. And I'm just little things like that, but I'm so thrilled and not just for a physical address in the city, which itself is no less a miracle than the sun coming up and going down. Uh, but the fact that God has assembled a group of people here, because the church is not a building, it's not an address, it's something living, and you are that church. And let me also say, while it sounds like we're on a mutual admiration society kick here, God has given you an amazing shepherd yeah. in Pastor Stephen. And I say, I say this in all affection and reality. Uh, Stephen, you're one of my favorites. I mean, this man, this man speaks. When you hear him speak, he's not speaking as a man of 30-some-odd years old. There is a depth that he speaks from that is a wisdom of the ages. And he draws that out in such an amazing way. And so you're so fortunate. Yeah to have this man. Turn in your Bible to the book of Colossians, if you would. The book of Colossians will be right in the first chapter. And this is an incredibly powerful passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. And I'm reading from the NIV 84, the nearly inspired version 
Um, all, all charismatics have to use the NIV. All right, let's read this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And for by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers, authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I want to repeat that little phrase. In him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Let's pray. Lord, do what only you can do this morning. God, we ask by your spirit that first of all, that you open our ears that we might hear what the spirit might be saying to the church. But God, beyond just hearing, God, let us be doers. We ask for your anointing in this moment. God, let us move beyond checking the box another Sunday and another message. But Holy Ghost, have amen. your way in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Beginning last summer, God dropped a word into my spirit. It was the word entropy. Entropy. Now, Pastor Mark is been around forever. <laughs> Pastor Duke's not here, so you are the official old guy designee this morning. But Pastor Mark and Debbie's history with Grace Covenant Church here in the city, it goes back many, many years. And this word entropy, I mean, and, and Pastor Mark and Pastor Brett are great friends. Pastor Brett is Mr. Science Guy. Okay, he loves everything science. I mean, most of us, you know, we, we read, we entertain ourselves with trivia and kitty cat videos from YouTube, you know, but he reads science books. Who is this man? But I had to look up what the word entropy meant. And in short, it's a word, kind of a euphemism for disorder and chaos. And it's just like, God, drop another word into my spirit. Because I don't think I really like that one much. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a moment, you've read something from Scripture, or you felt like God was impressing something on your spirit, and it's just like, could we maybe not do that one? Could we, could, could we get out of the book of Deuteronomy? Could we get out of the book of Lamentations? Could we move us into happier places, if you would? But this word would not shake loose. This word entropy... And if, as I've considered the confusion and the ongoing chaos around us, and this is not just limited to those things that constitute us being part of this nation, but as I look around the nations right now, and I'm not just talking about a military conflict in the Ukraine, but you begin to look literally from country to country, you begin to see this increasing disorder and this increasing chaos that's happening. And so it, it kind of led me to make some inquiries of the Lord. Is, and it, it, It's like, God, is, is this the, the cultural cliche of the new normal? Everybody heard that enough that if somebody says it in your presence, you just want to slap them? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, what a cliche that has become. But I couldn't think of better verbiage to approach the Lord. I said, is this the new normal? Is this chaos what, it, what it's going to be like? And then in my humanity, I begin to ask this question. If so, then when is it going to end? A little bit like the disciples. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? I mean, they're, they're very fascinated with these human constructs of time and methodology. When? And God, if, if, if this is indeed what you are calling us into, how do we thrive in the midst of this ever-increasing disorder? 
Not just how do we survive, but how do we truly thrive in the midst of all of this? Now, if we look at the definition of entropy, it is the second law of thermodynamics. Mr. Wikipedia here, so stay with me. But it states that unless outside energy is provided, a system will find its entropy or disorder staying the same or increasing as time goes by. So what this law states, this natural law, is that nothing stays the same. And entropy will increase unless a system will never get more ordered without outside intervention. Now, all the preachers on the front row, it's just like, I can preach that. But it says that a system will never get more ordered without outside intervention. In other words, this disorder based on the second law, a natural law of thermodynamics, it will never get better without the outside intervention of something larger that can come and not only overcome it, but supersede that natural principle. I'm getting ahead of myself. Consider this disorder, this chaos. Consider the closets in your home. You can have all the Marie Kondo moments that you want. You can do the container store. You can go to Lowe's. You can buy, you can buy, you know, closet systems. That's a big deal. They're companies that do nothing but come in and do closet systems. I mean, you go and you look at a different place to live. And what's the first thing that you do? You fling open the closet doors and the closets, they're empty. It's like the breeze of heaven itself. Or you open the cabinet doors in the kitchen and there's nothing waiting to jump out and attack you where you've shoved things in there. There are no junk drawers in the kitchen. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The glove compartment in your car, which has never had gloves in it. Why do they even still call it that? It's just another junk drawer except for your car. I mean, my wife has 87 napkins in there right now. She has to put both feet against it to close it because my wife is very, very frugal. And so every napkin that we get, you know, you go to McDonald's, they give you four French fries and 40 napkins to go with it. Not sure what the deal is there. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or any room that you place a child under three years old, that room will be in chaos in a matter of sheer moments. Wow. But I've added to this second law of thermodynamics that we see in principle around us all the time. I've added what I call Critcher's Laws. There are two of them, which I find to be true. The first is the quantity of stuff that one has is in direct proportion to the amount of space that one has to stuff it. <laughs> Proof is the fact that there are no empty closets in your home. And so it doesn't matter if you live in a 400 square foot apartment or if you live in a 4,000 square foot house, at some point, there will, everything will be occupied with what? Something. I also have a second law. It's called Critcher's Law of Horizontal Surfaces, which states that there is a strange attractional phenomena of any horizontal surface, hence your dining table. Any flat surface in your kitchen will attract backpacks and keys. You know what I'm talking about. And so this idea of, oh, look at this table. There's nothing on it. Just give it a few moments. Because I promise you, there's an attractional force. Entropy, disorder, chaos, a natural principle that has at its core a spiritual truth. Yet, it can only be, again, superseded supernaturally. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is writing specifically here about the church, about what a church service should look like. 
But he, he makes his statement. He says that God is not a God of disorder, but what? A God of peace. There you go. There's something about walking with God in the midst of disorder that we realize God is not the author of disorder, but he is the author and the perfecter of what? Our peace and our faith. But we remember this passage that we looked in Colossians 1, that in him all things hold together. You see, the farther apart that you get from a magnetic or a gravitational force, the weaker that connection becomes. So it gets easier to do what? Break away from it. This is why folk trying to get away from the atmosphere of the gravity of the earth, they have to have these very powerful rockets to break that gravitational pull. But once they get far enough away, all of a sudden now gravity is not an issue anymore. Because the gravitational pull of the earth, it diminishes as we get further away from it. You see, the very same thing happens to us in our relationship to God. The farther apart that we get, the lesser the gravitational pull back toward him. And you see, as humans, as we move farther away from God, the attraction lessens. And the in-working personally and the corporate outworking culturally lessens. And that's when the drift begins. It's what I call the drift is what is the beginning of progressive entropy. And let me give you the entire, the, 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 the entire process. It's not really a process as much as it is a regress. There's a drift. Then there's diffraction or distraction. There's disorientation. Then deception, disorder, decay, and death. This is the process. Let me read them again. There's, it starts with the drift. From the drift, we get easy, more and more easily distracted. And from the distraction comes a disorientation. And the disorientation from there to deception is a very, very short path. And once we get to deception, we get to defilement, disorder, decay, and death. But you see... The good news is entropy can be interrupted if we'll recognize the very first step and deal with it. And it's what I call the drift. You see, we never drift toward God. I want you to hear this. We never drift toward God. Because as humans and because of the effects of the sin nature, we tend to always drift away from God. Even as believers, we tend to move away from the things of the Spirit. We don't tend to drift toward the things of the Spirit. We have to be increasingly deliberate to break the power of the drift. Galatians chapter 4, Paul writing to this church here, and he was talking about turning back to the law and being righteous by, by, by saying, I did this and I didn't do this. But he says, but how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? You see, saints, your attraction, your attention, your affection does not automatically increase on the basis of election or sonship. You may say, well, I'm good. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Congratulations. That's super. But how do we deal with this intervening process of time? How do we deal with the forces of entropy and chaos that are around us? And you may say, again, it doesn't affect me. Let me tell you, saints, you are subject to the same forces of drift and decay as those who never knew God. Now, that may sound like an offensive statement. But let me tell you, many times if we pick this toy up right here, rather than reading our online Bible, when something goes beep, beep, we tend to go in that direction pretty quick. I mean, we can be in, in this moment of worship and study and God speaking, and then we feel this little taptic nudge, and the next thing we know, we have drifted. And it's amazing that we live in a culture that the drift is so easy 
to do. I think you would all agree with that. This is why Christians come back many times and they say, I I can't believe I did that. How did I wind up here? Because you didn't catch the drift before it went into these other directions over here. And you say, Pastor Jim, I, 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 I really I can't buy that much. Peter said the same thing. Oh, not me, Lord. And Jesus was just like, just give it a few minutes, buddy. Just, just give it a moment. Because you'll find out that you can go from receiving the greatest revelation ever given a human being that in a matter of moments you can drift. As your orientation and your motivation, it shifts from that revelation, that reality, to your own self-interest and motivation. Incredible how quickly it can happen. And you say, well, why is that? Well, Paul writes about it pretty extensively in Romans chapter 7. I mean, this is a man, I mean, it, it, it almost... If, if you didn't know it was the Apostle Paul writing, you would think this guy's got some real problems. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, it doesn't even sound. But I agree that the law is good. And as it is, if it's no longer I myself who do it. But it's sin living in me. And I know that nothing good. I mean, so Paul goes on and on about this phenomena of the drift. And again, this is not the newly saved Paul. This is not just Paul talking about former days, remember when. This is a fairly mature version of the dude saying, I'm still struggling with the drift. I recognize that there are things in me that are pulling me away from God and back toward that sin nature. Wow. Because you see, it's sin is what's set entropy in motion to begin with. Do you realize that God spoke a word and not only was there nothing, not only was there deep darkness, but there was chaos and disorder in that. And God spoke a word. The Greek there, the, excuse me, the Hebrew is the, is the debar of God. God said, let there be. And in that moment, God brought order out of chaos. Yeah. This is what the word of God does. When the word of God is, becomes rhema to you and me, the chaos of your life can be brought into order based on God's word. Yeah. But it all started in the garden. James 3, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And its genesis is in Genesis. Self-seeking. I can be like God. I mean, if I can know what God knows, then guess what? I can be like him. And we see that self-seeking. Two humans on the planet. And that drift occurred. Perfect conditions, uninterrupted fellowship, everything that they could ever have wanted. And here's another phenomenon about the garden. There was no decay in the garden. There was no death. There were no leaves to rake. There was no decay in the garden. There was only life. There was no death. And yet when sin entered the world, entropy entered with it. Fascinating. And so we look at these D's, the drift. But then there's the diffraction and the distraction. This is the consequence of choice masquerading as freedom. Carefully worded there. The consequence of choice masquerading as freedom. Disorientation, the ongoing confusion of choice. I talk about this all the time, but when, when, when my wife and I were kids and we would go to the grocery store, which basically were about the size of the current 7-Elevens, Pastor Mark, maybe an Aldi, all right? But now you go into these BM of 120,000 square foot grocery stores to buy a chicken. <laughs> Stay with me. 
And when we were growing up, there were two choices of chickens. There was a whole chicken and there was a cut up chicken. And the cut up chicken cost two cents more per pound. So your father taught you how to cut up a chicken, <laughs> right? But now you go into the grocery store, God is my witness, there's 60 feet of chicken. Every version of chicken. I mean, there's not only the chemical-laden, antibiotic-injected Franken's Franken chickens over here, but then you've got what my wife calls a happy chicken. It was a chicken that was free-range, organic. I mean, it had a name, Bob. It's right on the package right there. Who had this amazing, fulfilled life except for one really grim day. <laughs> Died with a smile on his feathered face. You understand what I'm saying? And then so you have the Bob chickens over here. And you've got all the variations, you know. I mean, and, and then you've got these parts that I didn't know existed. A chicken tenderloin. I didn't know what a chicken tenderloin was. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so your wife sends you to the store, get some chicken. And men, we walk in, and it's just like, uh, <laughs> did you get the chicken? No. <laughs> because it's so complex. And, but we call, come on, we call that what? Freedom. And from the disorientation then, is the deception. Well, it must be okay. It seems like everyone else is. And then from the deception, we move to disorder and defilement of, well, everyone actually is. Don't you love that word disorder? Disorder. It's a great, we used to just call it sin. Well, now we have a euphemism. We call it a disorder. I have a donut disorder. <laughs> you with me? Because I was damaged as a child. So I have a donut disorder. Let me, let me tell you my quick story of my donut disorder. I was a healthy child, which is a euphemism for husky, <laughs> chunky, large. All right. I'm not body shaming. I'm just stating what it was. We had our own category of clothes. They were called husky clothes. Most of them were brown and ugly, but that was the whole point. So we, my mother and my grandmother and myself, we went shopping one day, and we, you remember the old cars that had that big piece of glass in the back? And between the back seat and that back glass, there was a shelf right here that was big enough to get a small child on. And in the days before seatbelts, you would put a small child back there to rest, all right? And so my mother bought these dozen donuts and put them on that back shelf. And the heat of the glass heated the box up. And the smell of the donuts began to waft through the car. Are you getting the picture here? And like God smelling the sacrifices coming forth, I was smelling the aroma of these heavenly donuts. And I asked my mother very simply, can I have a donut? And my mother told me, no, it's too close to your dinner time. Well, you know, children always go into starvation mode about 15 minutes before dinner time. And I remember telling my grandmother, I looked at her appealing to the next generation. Guess what you do? Your parent says no, you go find a grandparent. And I looked at her and I said, these people are ruining my life. <laughs> and so when the Krispy Kreme donut opened in my city in North Carolina, I waited for my wife to get occupied. And I got my two children and I put them in the back seat of my car and I waited and, until the hot and now sign was on at the Krispy Kreme. You know, that red glow that indicates that God is in that place. <laughs> and I bought an entire box of hot Krispy Kreme donuts. And I put them between my two children. My wife was nowhere to be found. And I told him, eat as many as you can before we get home. One of my children was the very, you know straight, narrow, kind of looked around like this. The other child was double fisting in the box, 
Yeah, I mean, just, just to tell you. So disorder, I have one, just to tell you. And yet even disorder is becoming the order of the day. We've got language for it. Now, the norm, a way to escape culpability and accountability. Amazing. G.K. Chesterton, who was a pundit, writer, part-time theologian in England in the early 20th century, he wrote a piece entitled Taboos and Prohibitions. And he saw in his own England at that time becoming stranger by the day as well as strangely barbarous. The fads of the cultured were becoming more and more to resemble the habits of the barbarian. And all of this happening in the name of something called progress. Chesterton observed that what was happening all around him in England, he was led to conclude that there were historical moments when what he termed over-civilization and what he termed barbarism were close to becoming one and the same. And virtually the same thing might be said of America today. It's interesting. We're watching intrapical forces press in. Press in. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. So you may say, well, Pastor Jim, that's incredibly depressing. You may go back to where you came from. Please please, Please bring Pastor Stephen back. But how then do we navigate through these tides of cultural entropy? Well, let me go back to Colossians 1. First of all, headship. I'm going to give you three things. He is before all things. Rights of the firstborn. He's over all creation by him, for him. Here's a radical, life-changing revelation. We are living in his world, not yours. Oh, my goodness. By him and what? For him. My goodness. Parents. Children come out of the womb, all little insurrectionists. They don't have to be taught to be insurrectionists. They don't need siblings or children's ministry or school to train them how to do that. Because as soon as they can exercise their little wills, they're doing what? They're pushing back against your headship as mom and dad. They know how to do it. Where did it come from? Blame Adam and Eve. It's the sin nature that Paul was writing about in Romans 7. So the little insurrectionists, how their life gets shifted when they begin to realize he pays the mortgage. My room is in his house. All of this stuff was provided by him. And We spend our time as parents lovingly helping our little insurrectionists realize that, guess what? They are not in charge. Oh, my. And this is where happy times occur in the household, right here. When children demand their way, their rights, you ain't the boss of me. Uh, Last I checked, I was. And the amazing things, they're not in charge. And we, but what do we really want? When it comes right down to it, guys, we want to be in control. What do you want? Money. Nope. What do you want? Nope. I want to be in charge. Money is a means to being in charge. I want to be my own boss so that I can. Nope. You want to be in charge. It comes right down to something that fundamental and foundational. I want to be the man. I want to be large and in charge. And the terrifying thing about God, kids, he'll let us be in charge. He'll step back and say, give it your best shot. It's an amazing. God 
Because God isn't immature or insecure like you and me. He will step back and say, go ahead, drive it. Be master and commander of your own life. You'll be back. It's an amazing thing. And that authority sometimes is simply represented as, again, our ability to choose. That's how we represent ourselves. And it, isn't that the great American cry? The power of choice. Whether it's choosing our gender identification, power over the yet born, or whether or not we can legally have an Abrams tank in our garage and call it Second and, and Seventh Amendment rights. Second Amendment rights. I get to choose these things. We define freedom as that right. But what if, what if, Part of living in someone else's kingdom of their design, creation, and ownership with their designation as a sovereign king, it meant that the choices were already made for us. Would we still want to live in that kingdom? This is the conflict that many Christians have in their life. They want all the benefits of the kingdom but they still want to be in charge. I hate to tell you, but the two are not mutually exclusive. They're one in the same. It's why the Bible says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That understanding that Paul wrote to the, F to the Ephesians church, understanding his will, is that there's something that God has already ordained and designed for our life. Wow. Wow. And for those living in a world created by him and for him, those questions have already been asked and answered. Hmm. Headship. Then there's lordship. In everything he might have supremacy. It's the number one manifestation of headship. And let me say this. Discipleship is not lordship. Now, there's no true discipleship without lordship, at least biblically. They're human versions. In the church... Discipleship is often a discovery and realization process of personal destiny. I'm going to help disciple you into your gift set, into your placement. It's a good thing. Discipleship is not just a modification of behavior to the community norm. So we don't cuss as much when we come to church. And discipleship is not just being molded and folded into the machinery of the mission. And we can do all the stuff. Use the language and not really know him as Lord. Matthew 7, didn't we do all these things in your name? We cast out devils and we heal the sick. I didn't know you. That's why it says in James 4, submit yourselves then to God. You know, that word submission is a word that's become sadly archaic. My wife and I grew up in a came up at a time where things like biblical headship and a husband's role in the house and a woman's role with her husband, we taught these things and we taught it without any apology whatsoever as what we saw as a biblical order of how God had done stuff. But, you know, the reality is submission now has become the language of the oppressor. And yet the problem is it's biblical language. It is the true essence of Lordship as our designation as Christians, little Christs. And manifested lordship is deliberate submission. It's deliberate. Not my will, but thy will. I don't like this. I don't like this process. And God, if I'm really honest in this moment, I don't like you much. God already knows it. You can tell him. There are moments that you're, ch as children, you don't like your parents much either. But when it comes right down to it, you realize, I really am left with only one thing to do. And if I'm going to acknowledge headship and lordship, I've got to submit. It's no more, it's, it's no more complicated, nor is it any easier than that. And if it's then deliberate submission, it's also one of directed worship. This is my last point. Worship is manifested lordship. 
we live our lives with someone at the center other than ourselves. We live in a narcissistic culture. We really do. We're ill with it. Truly. Much of our worship opus in contemporary churches today, it's not worshiping God for who he is. It's worshiping God for what he's doing in and through us. What he's doing for us. How he's rescued us. How he's climbed over mountains to get to us. But the center of it is still us. It's not him. It's amazing. And you see, with self at center, entropy is guaranteed. Listen. Entropy is guaranteed. Because the drift says, I got it. Therefore, I deserve to be worshipped. Amazing thing. Revelation 3 to the church at Laodicea. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. Don't need a thing. And God's response is, you have no idea what your condition is. And it's not what we can do, but it's what we should. You see, worship shifts our life. Not a matter of, God, can I do this? Will, will, you, will you smite me? Can I, can I just, you know, I, I know I'm not supposed Can I just peek with one eye? You know, can I just, it, it's not, worship moves from this permissive, can I kind of, and get away with it, to, God, what pleases you? Everything begins to shift what pleases. It becomes the motivation for our worship response. It becomes manifested lordship is our worship. That in the midst of, what do you want from me? Acknowledge me in all things. What do you want from me? Worship me in spite of. Oh, my goodness. And what was the model for that? John 8. I always, Jesus, I always do what pleases him. And the mandate, it says, we have confidence before God. Why? Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. We obey, yes, but we do what pleases him. And if I could borrow a technique from John Piper, if we change one word, because we obey his commands by pleasing him not just and please but by pleasing him it's not a matter of god i'm going to obey you so you'll bless me i'm going to tithe so you'll pour out heaven on my on my finances god i'm going to do all these things because you promised that if i did this you would do this and yet there's no worship in that kind of transactional relationship whatsoever and the manifestation Ecclesiastes chapter 2, to the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. And might it be that when our worship shifts to whom it rightly belongs, the true manifestation of our relationship and our sonship might be realized when it shifts. Entropy. We live in a world that's increasingly chaotic. Increasingly disordered. Increasingly disorienting. And yet it says he is before all things and in him he holds all things together. How do we stop that drift? First, headship. We acknowledge he is the sovereign God. He made it all and he's got a plan for it all. And we don't have a better plan. Our plan is simply to discern his and get on the page. And then from headship, it's lordship. That we move from what we, the, the permissive, quote, will of God. What foolish language. We move from God can I to God should I. God, I don't want anything you don't want me to have. Regardless of how bad I think I want it. If you don't want it from my life, I don't want it from my life either. Lordship. And then worship is manifested lordship. That out of our life comes a motive and a motivation and a mandate to find out what pleases 
God. Unless an outside energy is applied, energy increases. And to the extent that we allow the blessed controller, you realize that's what Lord means? It means in its original language, blessed controller. Interesting. And as we allow that blessed controller to do exactly what God has designed himself to do, we get to turn back those forces of entropy. Pray with me. Lord, let us hear something by your spirit today. Lord, we know that we live in a life that seems to be increasingly chaotic and disordered. And our lives demand the outside intervention. And that intervention has a name. And his name is Jesus. And Lord, even if some of us in this room today have been walking with God for decades, Lord, we still have to guard ourselves against the drift. And we have to purpose ourselves to draw he says that if we, will, if we will draw near to you, you will draw near to us. We can't reverse that order. It's up to us to draw closer. And so, Lord, help us as a people. Lord, that we are known not just by our mission. We're not just known by our name or our association. But we're known as a people that acknowledge you as Lord. Not just in our worship service in a moment on a Sunday, but lordship on a Thursday. Help us by your spirit.